Next is, um, we're going to go on to Jason Mercier, who's the head of our Budget Reform Center, and he's going to give us an outlook on what's going on with the state budget, which is, involves lots of moving parts and lots of open questions, as well as a little bit about what happened with transparency and, and public disclosure in this last session, and how, kind of surprised, yeah, well, you know the issue. What transparency? That, that uh, <laughs> normally, for the general public, the process is, act, is pretty boring, and they don't pay much attention, but we were surprised that both during the session when... Um, Jason was blogging and reporting on what was going on during the session. That created tremendous interest. And then in addition, we wrote a couple of weekly columns that we sent out to uh, newspapers. Normally as a research organization, we would think, what could possibly be more boring than writing about disclosure requirements, committee meetings, uh, bills with titles and no text, things like that. And to our surprise, that got a tremendous amount of interest around the country. So you may find that when you're talking, I mean around the state, that when you're talking to people, these issues about the ability of citizens to follow what's going on in the legislature may actually be more important than you think. So here's Jason. Thank you. So in the packets for you are the resources I want to be mentioning. Uh, the transparency study we did with the constitutional amendment that we're proposing that was actually endorsed by the Seattle Times, Everett Herald, Columbia, and a handful of other papers. I'll get into the details of those a little bit later, but that's in your packet, that detailed language as well as our study on competitive contracting and what needs to change the state law to help address this current budget situation. And then you have a double-sided handout. That when you talk about the budget, these three resources are going to be, need to be your Bible. The first is this website you see up here. It's fiscal.wa.gov. That's a state website, <coughs> a state's budget website. We actually worked with the governor and the legislature to get it created. Not here is pretty much anything you'll need to know about the budget. Historical data, how much has been spent, how much is spent on travel for out of state, whatever you can think of are the details on it. You'll have the revenue information, the expenditures, differences between the operating, transportation, capital budget. Another nifty tool on this is during the legislative process, you can see the difference between the governor's submittal, the Senate's, the House's, how they compare, how they match up, federal funds, local funds, fees. So pretty much everything you need on spending is on this website. If you haven't, I recommend you spend a few hours and play around with it and see what questions you can answer if I'm finding that data. If you have questions on how to access that and use that website, I'm happy to help you out with it. The other Bible that you're going to need is the balance sheet and the six-year budget outlook. And that's the double-sided handout that you have in your folder. I'll briefly give you the update on what the next six months are going to look like, what next session is going to look like, how the voter is going to play a big part in what your options are. And I know you didn't run for office thinking about a legacy, but this is a legacy session. Whatever comes out of next year is going to set the state's framework as far as what put in a budget and what citizens can expect from government for not only the next decade, but probably generation. Short term, what are we looking at? You've probably heard about the deficits. There's a very immediate short term problem. And that's demonstrated by the balance sheet. What you'll see on there, including the tax increases, which were around $800 million, the state is still spending almost a billion dollars more than the forecasted revenue. There's a billion dollar structural gap right there. That got closed by taking funds from other accounts and the federal stimulus funds. Now, part of those federal stimulus funds cause an immediate problem that the governor is going to have to act on, potentially the legislature, next month. And that was relying on almost $500 million of additional Medicaid funds. Now, the president said it was going to be in his budget. At some point, it was in a House bill. At another point, it was in a Senate bill. But the closer we got to the election, Congress started getting a little bit of religion about the multi-trillion dollar deficits <laughs> and decided they're not going to provide these type of resources. It was a battle royale just to get the unemployment insurance bill reauthorized. So it is not going to, it's more likely not going to happen. The $500 million of net net funding is not going to come. Now, the balance sheet, while that matters, is that $500 million was included in assuming you're going to have a $250 million ending fund balance. So you take away that $500 million, you have an immediate short-term deficit of over $200 million. Can't happen by state law. So there's two possible scenarios. The governor can do across-the-board cuts, but that's a very restricted authority. She can't leave an ending fund balance. So all she can do is bring that balance sheet to zero. And it's a sledgehammer. There's no discretion on where those cuts occur. It's going to get education just as hard as it's going to get the Arts Commission, just as hard as it's going to get the corrections or the cultural. But it will bring the budget back into balance temporarily. What we've seen happening, though, over the last few months is continued drops in revenue. 
So there's two more forecasts before the legislature convenes, the September forecast and the November forecast. Based on what we're seeing, those are going to show additional decreases in what was anticipated. So if the governor just does the across-the-board cuts, she's going to have to do them again in September and again in November. And we're going to have to continue to have this uncertainty over what the budget is. The preferable option, not necessarily from a legislative standpoint, but from a policy standpoint, is to get the legislature to agree to some type of framework and call a special session either next month or in September so they don't just address the Medicaid shortfall. But you get a head start on the next problem, which I'll mention in just a second, while leaving a reserve. So we don't have to have any more special sessions or across the board cuts for the remainder of the year. The governor hasn't really indicated which one she's going to do. I think once it becomes clear how non-discretionary those across the board cuts will be, she'll make another pitch to the legislature to do a special session. But for the candidates and current lawmakers, a special session means a freeze on fundraising and having to take uh, difficult votes a month before the election. So you know, I'm not going to put my money on which of those options is going to occur. That's your short-term problem. The real thing that you're going to have to deal with next year is a three to five billion dollar structural gap, which grows to over eight billion dollars in the 2013 budget. Now that shortfall assumes over four billion dollars in revenue growth. So that's assuming the economy is recovering and you're getting an additional four billion dollars in the next budget more than you have right now. Now, what encompasses that three billion? It's two billion in replacing federal funds that we've been relying on right now. It's $700 million of making catch-up pension payments because of skip payments. Now, in all of the state's pension plans, the majority of them are what they would call healthy. They're funded, even though they're going to take a huge hit based upon what's happening in the stock market. The problem is they're in what they call PERS-1 and TERS-1. Those are two closed plans. They've been closed since the 70s. But in those plans, you have over a $6 billion unfunded liability. Those were the plans where the pension payments were skipped over the past decade. And that's why you're going to see a $700 million contribution required in this next budget, going to $1.2 billion in the following budget. This has a big impact on locals as well because they have to match those contributions. You're going to hear a lot from local governments about the cost of pensions they're having on their bond. Another big component of that $3 billion shortfall are two edu education initiatives that passed in 2000. Initiative 728 and 732 account for a billion dollars of that $3 billion shortfall. A little bit of background on those. At the time they passed, we had a $2 billion surplus. Governor Locke ran the campaign for them, promised they weren't going to hurt the budget. We had surplus funds, no tax increases being required. You had 9 11, you had to drop in those revenues. The legislature decided to temporarily suspend them. The education community didn't like that, so they put another initiative on the ballot, Initiative 884, it's a billion dollar sales tax increase to fund those free initiatives. Failed in every county in the state. So as far as the intent of the voters, I don't think that you can extrapolate out what they wanted them if they had to raise taxes to pay for it. How much is that worth? A billion dollars of the three billion. So, it's, so you're talking about two billion dollar replacement of stimulus dollar, a billion dollar in initiatives, and seven hundred thousand in seven hundred million or seven hundred million in uh, in pension. So that's a three point seven billion dollar problem next year. Well, but you have the growth also. So you have the $4 billion revenue growth. And you also, I mean, those are the three major components that aren't part of what they call the base budget. And this is where the budget process needs to change. I'm actually been appointed by the governor to a transforming the budget committee, and that's part of the process of realizing just because it's in the existing baseline does not mean it's in next year's budget. And that's part of the solution that hopefully will be available to you come January, is the governor will hopefully include in her budget recommendations how we restructure state spending. And we have some suggestions that we'll get to in just a second as well. And when does your group publish that? We have put some of them in your handouts. We have them ongoing recommendations, what we hope to be able to provide. I mean, the, gov the governor's. Governor's budget is due in December. In years past, it's called what is the book one budget. That's the current law budget. What she'll need to do is a second budget. Now, usually when you have a second budget, it's a revenue budget. Here's the, uh, here's the taxes that we'll raise. Depending on what the voters do, that second budget may not be the tax budget. It will be, here's the laws that need to change to restructure state spending. Mm -hmm. That's what hopefully will come out of this transforming the budget exercise that's happening right now. Go for it. 
You talked about the drawing to eight billion. Can you break that down? It's in the six-year outlook. Uh, okay. It's in your handout there. Now, it won't kick that amount because you can't have a unbalanced budget, so some of that will get addressed to whatever you do next year. Right. But it's, it's continuing out again those pension contributions and again having to replace those federal funds. Because I mean, as, met, as Roger mentioned, we did some cost shifting. We took some stuff off the state books, put it on the federal books. We're going to have to take those back. Are you going to talk about the $11 billion unfunded in the workers' comp? Maybe Carl will. Is Carl in here? Yeah, he's next. Okay, so hopefully Carl will get some. Okay, good. thank you. Look at the, the forecasts for the, for the years. What happened when 20, 2009 and 2011 it jumps from 14 to 28? How can they substantiate that much of a jump in revenue forecast? Well, the tax increases. They jump well, what you need to be looking at, I think you're looking at a, a fiscal year, so you won't look at the biennial numbers, the $30 billion to the $33 billion. But if you look at that same thing in 2000, as you look ahead, right, it's 15 and 16, and then it jumps to 32, so then when it jumps to 30 million. No, that's the biannual. That's figure. the biannual. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so you're going to back to you. What's your, uh, yes, sir. So are you going to go through the laws that have to be changed? We're going to try to, we're we'll trying to, <laughs> to this out. Right? Yeah. Let me give you this one example right now that we'll have to have. So not only do you have a chance to set the state's course through whatever you're going to do, but the voters are going to have very clearly tell you what they want you to do. There's three initiatives on the ballot that are going to determine what your options are. The first is Initiative 1053, that's the supermajority requirement for tax increases. <coughs> initiative 1098, which Paul's going to talk to you, is the multi-billion dollar income tax initiative. The initiative 1107 repeals a handful of the taxes that were raised this year. Right. So if you have a combination of the two-thirds majority passing, a repeal of the taxes this year, and a, re and a rejection of the income tax initiative, the message will be very clear. We want you to restructure the current programs, and taxes are off the table. If you have 1053 fail, you have the income tax initiative passed, and the repeal fail, then they'll say we like the status quo when tax increases are the direction to take. Your current polling data on where those stand? Uh, the income tax initiative is a wash right now. Uh, two supermajority is in the 60s, and I haven't seen anything on the tax repeal. So, but if it's a wash, it's going to fail. Generally, they need to be in the 60s at this point to pass. Uh, That's good. That's great. Good. <laughs> so now the laws that need to change. Back to your question. If you have the message from the voters, the tax increases are off the table, no matter what comes out of the governor's recommendations, you're going to have to go back to a law that was passed in 2002, the civil service reform, <coughs> that did two things that are going to tie your hands as legislators. Although it authorized competitive contracting of state services, prior to that it was prohibited by a court ruling. It also removed from the legislative process anything to do with the collective bargaining and compensation issues for more state employees. That's mm -hmm. now so in the domain of the government. An example of how this is not working is look at Pierce County. This past week, the Pierce County Council had to grudgingly approve pay raises mm -hmm. because the only option was to say yes or no. And as they phrase right. it, it's yes or an unfair labor practice laws. Right. It's already been negotiated with the executive. Ultimately, it needs to happen to provide not only you the flexibility, but to empower agency directors. Currently, agency directors really are just babysitters of bureaucracy. They can't do anything outside of that contract. So that law needs to be reopened. The competitive contracting aspect of it just needs to simply be, you can competitively contract. You have to make a business case for it, and you have to provide oversight for it. But all of the hurdles in that to an agency director to do it need to be removed. <coughs> Because it's not occurring because agency directors don't want to go through the hassle. What is that all number? Uh, I can get you the number. It's civil service reform for 2002. Right. And then the second aspect of that, the legislature needs to take back control of the contracts. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It yes. needs to be part of every other process, every other prioritization, every other program. If you're going to have collective bargaining at a state law level, it should just be on the work conditions. All compensation needs to be part of the legislative process. Mm -hmm. So those are the two big things that have to happen to allow any of these reforms to move forward. But I thought the uh, governor, well, how, how will the legislature be able to get away from the governor? It's, the it's governor a statute. Up? You just need oh, to change okay. the statute. All right. Thanks. 
Currently, the governor is negotiating those contracts. And that will be part of the budget submittal. Uh, so, what you would need to have happen, I guess, as far as time, it would need to pass very quickly. She so would need to sign it to help you impact the current budget. Who's on those negotiating teams? Uh, the, the governor appoints a uh, personnel team. It's part of the budget process. Jason, how does the governor uh, rectify then uh, in having that kind of authority with meanwhile getting the majority of her the financial support from Avery Means? Uh, we'll leave the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there could be a conflict of interest there, possibly. <laughs> I think that's why she probably hasn't yes. declared an emergency yeah. to open up the yeah. contracts. Yeah. Are you yeah. getting any uh, rumors right. that she might do that? Uh, for nothing on, on that front, the, well, the, the bottom line is this, this session is going to be determined by Initiative 1053. If that passes, the governor's budget recommendation will have to be within the existing revenue forecast, and that will provide the blueprint for the legislature on what her thinking is. Now, she's asked eight questions of agencies. The, every year, or every budget cycle, OFM provides agencies the budget instructions. Here's how you submit to us what it is you want to spend money. What they did this year is agencies are required to answer eight questions first. Among those, is this a function of government? Can it be provided by user fees? Is it federally required? Can you move to competitive contracting? Can we incentivize to performance incentives? So every agency, if they follow the directions, will at least provide their self-reported answers to these questions. And that's then where the governor's panel can come in and see if there's some different ways to answer those questions. But the hope is then that budget is, that is proposed to the legislature will already have laid out some of those answers. Now, yes, sir, ma'am. Uh, uh, so I'll go there. So. Just to let you know, uh, we got your polls on 1053 and 1098. Uh, you said 1053 was 60 40. Is that 60 in favor of, the, of repealing this current suspension? Like four? A two thirds no, so, so, the, so, no, the, uh, the, the polling on the 1053 was, I think, 64, something like that for passage. I remember for okay. So that'll bring it back to a two thirds of the way. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, in the background supermajority, this is not new. It feels like Groundhog Day. It is. <laughs> <laughs> 1993, 1998, 2007, and actually the voters went a step further in 1999 by passing an initiative that would require voter approval of all taxes. Right. Court talks. And then, and then the what was 1107? 1107 is the repeal of the soda tax, gum right. tax. What was the poll? I have not seen poll. Okay, thank you. The, to add to your point, that in February, when the governor signed the repeal of the two-thirds voting requirement, mm -hmm. um, there was a poll done that 74% of respondents said that they disapproved right. of the governor repealing suspending. the requirement. Suspending the requirement. Right. Now, along those lines, 16 other states have supermajority requirements for tax increases. All of theirs are constitutional. Ours is the only statutory one, which is why we keep going through this exercise. Now, the opponents of a supermajority will point to California, saying it's just dysfunctional. Even, even the Californians want to get rid of the two-thirds requirement. Now, there's a, a bit of a, a qualifier in that statement, though. The two-thirds isn't just for taxes, it's also for adopting the budget. So a constitutional amendment is on the ballot right now in California to get rid of the two-thirds for the budget, but explicitly retains the two-thirds for the tax increases, right. mm -hmm. which would basically put us back to where we were as a state prior to the suspension this year. And that's Portland 65 percent. <coughs> the eight questions that you talked about, the governor asked each agency to produce the answers. Uh, is it required that they answer them, or is no, it's, they're, they're to required to do? And actually, I, I got a call from an agency yesterday complaining about them only having 260 characters to answer each question. <laughs> 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 money would save in the budget to cut uh, tax exemptions for special interests on the B&O tax and the sales tax? There, there is a tax expenditure report for the exemptions, and there's actually now two separate committees called, I think, served on both of them. One was passed by law a few years ago to require a review of all the tax exemptions to see what the legislative intent was, should they be retained or repealed. Actually, a hearing just this week on some of those recommendations. Then this past year, the legislature included in the budget a 
brand new committee to ask the same questions. So those reports are out there. And uh, I think the Department of Revenue assigns a dollar amount to each of those. Okay, you can go to that. Yeah, you can get that from the Department of Revenue. Where can we get the eight questions? Uh, multiple places. Uh, the governor's website, the advisor website, or send me an email, I'll get them to you. Okay. In the initiative that's uh, proposing restoration of the two-thirds majority to raise taxes, did, does that mean um, to raise projected tax revenue or to increase tax rates on existing taxes or to implement new taxes? It, it's any of these are subtle but important yes, it, Revenue is clearly defined in the statute on, on increasing revenue. So any vote of the legislature that either raises a rate that generates more tax revenue beyond just your current base economic growth requires that super but, but I think you might be asking if does it affect natural growth in the economy no, that results no, in higher it changes to tax statute will require it to do so would it would uh, pardon me so it would change the tax statute right, right so that would mean adding a new tax or increasing the rate yeah, under the cutting tax. Tax. Yeah. so increases in revenue that result in the natural growth in the economy are not affected by this level Sorry, sorry. Just <laughs> cutting a tax exemption to require correct. They would generate that. So, and then how are they getting around that with fees? <coughs> Is that just because they're well? Fees only require a simple majority vote. Right, but I'm saying, but I mean, and all, I mean, ultimately, they're, but they're getting around the fact that some of those fees are really taxes. But, right. right. So, so, I mean, that would be if, if you can go to the Department of Revenue and make the administrative case on the fee as a tax. And, <laughs> but there is there is a process to determine whether it's supposed yeah. to be fee or tax. We're not paying my phone bill and I have to pay, you know, $8 in fees. Um, <laughs> to me, that's a tax. But anyway, so that's a good argument. So this past session, the things that have gotten the voters' interest, obviously, were the budget and the taxes. And the second one was the process with which these bills were adopted. Legislative rules are, are actually pretty good. It's required five-day notice of a public hearing. It's supposed to let you know what bill is going to be voted on. It requires multiple readings on separate days. Unfortunately, the rules are suspended. <laughs> yeah, we saw that. So what we propose in the back of there again is a constitutional amendment that would require at least three days notice before we could hold a public hearing on a bill. Require there to actually be text to a bill before we could vote on it. <laughs> and mandate at least a 24 hour period to where lawmakers can read what they're reading right. before final passage. Yes. Now, the example of this was an interesting dynamic on one of the taxes seeking to be repealed on the soda tax. That was never part of any of the legislative recommendations. It showed up and surprised a lot of people. And the way it was drafted was actually differently than what was being worked with the uh, industry on. So the legislature thought they were passing something that was going to exempt in state bottlers. That's not what they ended up doing. Once they realized that, they realized they're going to put a lot of people out of work. The Speaker of the House asked the governor to veto it for a tax that, that they get pushed. Now, the reason this all ha happened the 120 page tax bill was voted on hours after it was introduced. Mm -hmm. Nobody had a chance to actually see what it was, and you know, not even the lobbyists who knew what the impact would be. Who was responsible for pushing that into the legislature? Somebody must have written Nobody's it. Nobody's taking, taking credit for that aspect. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody must have retired. Well, I guess this goes back to part of the problem with the conference committees technically are public committees. You're supposed to be able to attend those mm -hmm. and see what's happening. Yeah. What they did, though, is they came to an agreement outside of the committee then they put out the notes, okay, here comes the committee, and they just rubber stamp the report. So there was no vetting of what the committee did. Yeah. So, so, so a few people put together what they wanted, then it went to the committee where they didn't discuss it, and then the undiscussed but passed document was then sent to the then drafting office, which drafted it. Well, not, not quite that bad. They, they didn't have it drafted, they just nobody had a chance to read it to see what it said. Do, uh, if you have long periods, would that slow down the process enough so that it would give the legislators more time to digest? Well, well I mean, there's, there's one potential loophole around the amendment that we propose. That's what's called striker amendments, to where you can just basically have a whole cloth new bill attached to a previous bill. Mm -hmm. Short of mandating every potential legislative rule in the Constitution, which is not a good thing to do, <laughs> the hope is that by shining enough light on the process, if that were to occur, it would raise enough red flags where it would have to be justified. And we ultimately catch that, hopefully, by the requirement that after a bill 
leaves the committees and goes to the floor, from the rules to the floor, there's that 72 hour time period before they can vote on it. So at least somebody can read it and see what it says. And then the final safeguard is you can't vote on final passage till <coughs> physical document is available for them. Uh, let's make this your last question. Oh. We'll it, it's not a question, it's a, a comment. And the other thing that was happening is that they were taking an older bill with a similar title, bringing it to the floor, gutting it, putting new stuff underneath it, running it through a vote immediately. There was no public hearing, no public input. The title, this is a title only bill. <laughs> and, and what title only bills serve the purpose of is to circumvent the legislative cutoff. So they can move things at the end of session. You know, maybe they have some value to that, but from my standpoint, you can either amend your rules or you, you don't move things late in session that are so important that you don't have time to read them. Or read. The bills I'm talking about, though, weren't ghost bills. They were bills that had content yeah. and they used so the strikers. Perfect, perfect yeah. example of that, uh, a bill that ultimately failed in the Senate. It would have increased car insurance fees to pay for auto theft because the legislature right. rated millions of dollars from the auto theft account last budget. The Senate rejected it. For some reason, the House decided to bail the Senate out, pulled up a House bill, and tried to attach that failed Senate bill as a striker. And that was without the public hearing or the notification. Now, the House didn't move it either because of that enough outcry over that process. But that, that's kind of what happens. And until that constitutional amendment passes, you have to look forward to as lawmakers. Is the process all ruled? Is it based on lawmaking or is it statutory or code? Currently, it's legislative rules. Legislature Constitution, Legislature Consensus on the rules. Okay? Thanks, and